As a book hoarder, I might be a hypocrite for saying this, but book hoarding within the bookish community, whether you're on BookTok or BookTube, has become a prevalent problem. In fact, it's something of a joke that bookworms are notorious for purchasing piles of books, which we then neglect to read. Plenty of book talkers instill book buying bans on themselves, but inevitably, we end up breaking them. After making a promise to only buy one book when we enter a store, we emerge with our arms full. This tendency we have is exacerbated not only by how good it feels to buy shit, but by our wider bookworm culture. One of the most popular types of videos on any platform is the book haul. And while some have tried to combat this shameless consumerism with library book hauls or unhauls, the original book haul format remains a winning one. Whether we're blowing through our hard-earned cash or watching other people do so, we have an obsession with collecting. It doesn't help that we have endlessly long TBR lists, otherwise known as to be read. When a reader refers to their physical TBR, they might mean the books that they can hold versus those on the Kindle, but they could also be referring to the books they don't own yet. With these lists, some hosting hundreds of books, it becomes impossible to enter a bookstore without buying something. In itself, collecting books isn't a bad hobby. Since the medieval times, people have made a practice out of hoarding manuscripts. The emergence of the printing press simply made this compulsion more accessible. And here we are. Given how consumption-driven our society as a whole is, it's not surprising we suffer from this habit. Other people hoard clothes or art supplies, while we hoard books. The collection of novels or of manga and graphic novels is our own special form of retail therapy. A relatively benign hobby, it can be difficult to see the problem. After all, if you're having fun and you have the space and money, what's the problem? Well, as with anything, you can have too much of a good thing. Spend enough time on booktube or booktalk and the problems with this mindset become apparent. Before we continue, I'm Riley and this is Otherworldly Fiction. On this channel, I rant about books, discuss reading and writing, and offer the occasional writing advice. If any of that sounds like your cup of tea, hit that subscribe button. Buying books is, for the most part, a fun and harmless hobby. However, if taken too far, it can create its share of problems. Ones which demonstrate how consumerist book talk and booktube have become. The first problem is not reading the books you have. I'm fairly good about reading the piles of books I've amassed, but as someone who has read 100 books in a year, I hardly represent the average reader. Plenty of bookworms might read 15 books a year, but end up buying more books than I have. Now, I'm not defending myself. Counting off the top of my head, I realized that I bought 87 books last year. I'm not rich, but I earn tips from my job and I'm good at finding deals, especially when I use my favorite UK-based store, Awesome Books. These are just the books I could think of though, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were 5 to 10 books I'd completely forgotten I bought to say nothing of the gifts I received as birthday or Christmas gifts. I have no way of knowing how many books I truly have, but with more on the way and a list of books I had to buy for Christmas, my collection is certainly growing, which means my physical TBR will grow as well. Personally, I take comfort in having so many unread books because it means I'll always have something to dive into regardless of my mood. But other readers suffer anxiety when they consider how many books they've neglected. Worse, some actually lose interest in the books they've accumulated, especially if they're a mood reader, leading them to give away books they've spent hundreds of dollars on. 
it was in this way I ended up with the Shadow and Bone trilogy. Offered on Facebook Marketplace for $30, I learned from the seller that her daughter had purchased them brand new and then promptly lost interest in them. She didn't so much as open the first book. These books were literally still in their plastic wrap, as new as the day they were purchased from chapters. One YouTuber I follow described her pile of books as a burden, adding that she wants to be surrounded by books she loves. As I enjoy most of my books, I tend to keep the majority, though I plan to get rid of those I didn't. Still, I can relate to what she's saying, because when it comes to the books I don't want, it's aggravating to look at them. Another shallow tendency we have is to judge a book by its cover. In fairness, some books have remarkable covers. I spent the extra $5 on Juniper and Thorn to get the original cover, something I don't usually do because I loved it so much, but most of the covers I see people raving about are beautiful but generic. We've all heard the saying, but those on Book Talk especially like to make a big deal about the cover. Along with that, people go on about the artwork on the dust jacket, the illustrations, and what people call spreadges or sprayed edges, a part of the fourer over fourth wing related to people's desire for the decorated editions. Again, I'm not knocking people. I can appreciate a book that's signed or illustrated, particularly if it comes from an author I love. One thing I'd love to get are the Mina Lima editions of Harry Potter, because they're beyond gorgeous. But I don't think every book we own should be like this. It puts a lot of pressure on publishers to design these elaborate covers, with so much attention being paid on book talk to how aesthetic books are. Publishers will focus on the packaging. The unfortunate downside is that truly great stories are being overlooked. Even those with perfectly serviceable covers are forgotten or missed because of the intricate artwork more popular books have. Now, I haven't read Fourth Wing yet, so I can't say if it's worth the hype, but there are mediocre reads out there being chosen over classics solely because of how pretty they look on the book talk feed, which is a slap in the face to writers and readers alike. As a writer who plans to self-publish, that's also something I can't compete with. I could include illustrations in my book, but to do so would mean shelling out hundreds to an artist, with a little chance of earning that money back. And as far as I know, platforms like Amazon don't offer spreads as an option in their print-on-demand services, leaving me at a disadvantage when competing with prettier titles. As a quick aside, be sure to like this video if you're enjoying it so far. Next, we come to those who spend outside their budget. As I've said before, while I buy too many books, I don't spend outside of my means. For me, the greater problem is a lack of space. I live with my parents, which means my hundreds of books sit in my bedroom. And my mother's concern that my floor will cave in is probably valid. That said, if I was to total the money I spent on books, I'd probably be horrified. For those creators trying to build a following online through book haul videos, the problem is greater. In some cases, readers fall into the trap of buying books they aren't that excited about, either as a result of FOMO when they hear about another trending book, or so they can show off all the new releases they've snagged. If you think seriously about how many books you want to read right now, I'm willing to bet the number isn't as high as you think. I have hundreds of books on my TBR, but being something of a mood reader, there are only about 24 books on that list I'm burning to read at this very moment. If I had to buy 10 to 20 books every month just to make book haul videos, I'd likely end up with dozens, if not hundreds, of books I wasn't interested in. 
At the very least, if I did read them, it could be years before I did so. People also feel pressure on this platform to buy books that look nice. It's not enough to buy enough books to make a library. No, people want the best of the best. They seek out first editions, limited runs with sprayed edges, and signed copies so they can show off how cool they are. I'm not against people collecting books of value, especially if it's an author you love. But there are readers who feel a need to buy all their books like this. While I'm more than happy to buy used editions with covers that were ugly 10 years ago, there are people who won't be happy unless they purchase glossy hardcovers. And some will rack up credit cards or sacrifice their ability to eat in order to meet this expectation. Like those who drive fancy cars, some bookworms have used books as a way to tote their success, spending money they don't have and racking up debt for stories that might not even matter to them. One of the biggest offenders on this list, the tendency for people to exclusively buy popular books is worsening as people are compelled to share their book hauls and review what they're reading online. For creators and readers alike, this has become frustrating as the same five books are shown over and over again. Anyone who goes on Book Talk will receive recommendations for Colleen Hoover, even if they hate romance. And books will be hyped to the point that people are sick of hearing about them. Often, after a year or two, these books will vanish, making you wonder if they were so great to begin with or if people only care when something is brand new. After appearing exhaustively in my feed, I never see The Cruel Prince on Book Talk. In my opinion, it's a decent book, but people, after obsessing over it, already seem to have written it off because it's not the shiny new release. Seeing a book die off like this is depressing, but it can be aggravating for readers when a trend won't go away. Even the most diehard fantasy fans are getting sick of hearing about a Qatar. And while I don't mind discussion of the series, I'm a fan. This means I'm biased. And I can only imagine how irritating it's been for those who aren't fans of fantasy or Sarah J Maas. As someone who mostly reads fantasy, I could do without hearing about the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo for the 200th time. While I've enjoyed most of the popular books in my niche, there are many readers who were turned off by them. And that's understandable. If you're not into YA, kissing, and guys with wings and tails, the books that get pushed out time and time again aren't going to appeal to you. Though I'm fortunate that I am into those genres, I can appreciate how frustrating it is for readers with their own tastes. For those looking for westerns, mysteries, or classics, it can be difficult. There are readers who actively search for creators with tastes closer to theirs, but even they struggle to find people they gel with. And on the creator end of things, it's challenging to gain traction from videos which discuss lesser known books. The result is that creators, even those who started their channels out of passion, end up regurgitating the same recommendations because that's become the only way to grow. Readers in the fantasy niche are being pressured into reading dragon romances where they might be reading Angela Carter instead because that's what gets the views. Personally, I enjoy booktube and hope to get back into book talk. I'm also an avowed book hoarder, but even I can admit there's a downside to our hoarding. Be it how much we buy, what we're buying, or our motivations for doing so, consumerism has become a real problem in the bookish community. With book hauls continuing to dominate, and creators being pressured into buying for the sake of buying, it could be argued that we've commercialized our hobby. We've packaged and commodified it, 
turning it into an instance of keeping up with the Joneses, instead of what it should be, a fun hobby done for its own pleasure. In chasing some expectation or number, we've lost track of why buying books was fun, and by extension, why it was important to read them. I'm never going to stop buying books, but I try to buy books that mean something to me and to support the authors I genuinely love, whether their book came out two months ago or 20 years ago. It goes without saying that buying so many books can be expensive, but thankfully I know several ways to save money. Click the video on the left if you want to learn how you can hoard books within your means, and click the video on the right if you'd like to get them for free. As always, thanks for watching and happy reading.